Okay, here we are at part six. It's our final part in this series on prayer. Let's pray. Father, as we continue uh, and today finish our look at prayer, would you walk with us? Would you shape our thinking? Would you inspire our hearts? Would you warm our souls as we listen to your voice and think about how we pray? Amen. Okay, Milton Jones, crazy haired stand up comic, is a Christian and I was reading some of his stuff uh, recently. He wrote this When it works, church is like Lego. Accommodating each other's knobbly bits makes us all stick together. The thing about prayer is it's absolutely rooted in relationship. And as my relationship with God deepens, so do my prayer. The way I, I talk to Him changes, the way I hear Him changes. Our conversation with those we know changes as we get to know them better. We reveal more, we learn more, we trust more as that relationship grows. This perhaps is a good moment to look at the first five parts of our series on prayer. What's the story so far? Well, prayer is a conversation with someone who loves us. Simple prayer starts with who we are in the here and now. In dark times, bleakness and struggle, we cling to God through prayer. Prayer includes making time and space to listen to God. We should remember to pray together and we ought to do that, raising voices and listening together and remembering to help and encourage each other as we do. And at this point, I'd like to encourage you by saying that, uh, that, uh, that when there are people gathering together at prayer times, that's, um, that's really special. It's inspiring. It, it gives us a sense of um, the reality of the body of Christ. It's crucial that we have a relationship with God. It's crucial because nothing that makes any sense at all has any value without having that sense that there's a relationship between God and us. God created humanity for a relationship with him and he created humanity for community too. God himself exists in relationship, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, and God repeatedly tells his people that he will be their God and they will be his people. Leviticus 26 verse 12 says exactly that, I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. The relationship between humanity and God is fundamental. People are not a byproduct of creation. God's intention is to have a relationship with us. It's why the history of God's interaction with people is full of instructions and explanations designed to sustain and deepen that relationship. It's why the cross is so crucial. The cross is pivotal in God's plan to restore the relationship between God and humanity. God's determination to finally crush the power of sin and death is what led to the resurrection of Jesus, the promise of life in all its fullness, with God our Father. When that kind of life and that kind of relationship is promised, a relationship of unquenchable love, with someone who has all the strength and love there could be, anything less would be almost unutterably awful. This desire that God has to have and to hold an enduring relationship with you and me is an amazing and wonderful thing. God went to such enormous painful lengths, becoming human, living and loving and eating and drinking and celebrating and mourning and teaching and healing and suffering and dying, doing all that so he could restore a relationship with us, with you, with me. This desire is also expressed in the way Jesus explained how to pray. How amazing it is in Matthew 6 to see Jesus talk clearly about the importance of avoiding any approach to prayer that is repetitive and long-winded and wordy and designed to impress other people. Don't do that, he says. You don't need to. It's not needed. It's not welcome. It's not appropriate. The model of prayer he gives is incredibly brief. Jesus starts his guide to prayer with relationship. Our Father based on an approach to relationship. God is holy, there can be no argument with this, and the Bible is repeatedly clear, Old and New Testament. Jesus doesn't start with holy and mighty, he starts with Father. And then the bit I want to direct our attention to is verse 12 and then 14 and 15. Understanding verse 12 does mean taking a look at verse 11. So having started with the prayer by saying our Father, this part of the prayer is focused on what disciples need. Give us the food we need and forgive us. We need forgiveness. Jesus is telling us that we need God's forgiveness as much as we need to eat. And taking hold of forgiveness means admitting that we need it. That admission is crucial. We can't ask for something uh, with any uh, integrity if we think we don't need it. When we say our prayers of confession aloud or in the quiet of our heart, we are being honest about that need. 
Simon Ponsonby, Oxford-based preacher and author, writes that our word sin comes from the Old English. Sin, S-Y-N, and is similar to words in Old Norse and High German and Old French, all meaning guilty. J.C. Ryle, a 19th century English bishop, describes sin as the things that don't match with who God is. Sin is what you're left with when holiness isn't there. It's things that aren't God's being or God's character. Sin is separate from God. So when we think or say or do things that don't line up with God's way of being and doing, then we are separate from God. We become separated from him. The relationship that God longs to have with us is damaged, it's broken, it's messed up and needs to be put right. We need to be reconciled, reconnected. The relationship needs to be restored. And Jesus tells us in the Lord's Prayer to ask for forgiveness. We need to admit our need for it because we keep choosing ways that aren't God's. We choose not God rather than yes God. Our prayers of confession then are prayers of reconciliation. Our prayers that restore our relationship. The prayer of confession is a relationship prayer. In confession we say that we want the relationship with God and that we want to repair what's been damaged, to put right what's gone wrong, to rebuild that connection with God. Now there is an important question to ask here. When we sin, when we mess up, is it that we're breaking the rules or is it that we're damaging the relationship? It, it may be that you want to say the answer is both. But I want to suggest it's maybe only the first one. The rules are only there to help us build the relationship. The rules aren't there for rules sake. If God's desire is for a relationship with us, if creation expresses that desire, and I believe it does, if Jesus telling us to call God Father reflects that relationship, then when we ask for forgiveness, we are seeking to rebuild the connection. Genuine confession then does not try to even out our sin account. It's not trying to, it's not trying to do management of our sin. Instead, it's built on our desire to be right with God. It's built on our desire to renew that relationship with him. When we confess to God, we are not trying to score a point in our forgiveness column. We're not doing something. We're not, we're not giving something in return for something. We're not, we're not fulfilling a transaction. We're, we're uh, holding out a hand. We confess to repair the relationship with our father. Just as you say sorry to a friend to put things right, not because he's trying to score a point. When you say sorry to a true friend, you're not just trying to get yourself off the hook. You're wanting the relationship to be healthy. And that's why we read in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, that love does not keep a record of wrongs. What's brilliant is that when we confess, when we approach God in our here and now, confess that we've messed up and ask for forgiveness, he freely gives it. He just does. He just gives it for forgiveness to us. And back to Milton Jones again. Sometimes... He writes as if a few of us can't cope with the fact that if you really say sorry, he really does let you off. So we have to make up other rules and special ways of talking to sort of help punish everyone. But the thing is, it really is that easy. God's longing for a relationship with us means that he has already done everything that he's doing so that we can just be forgiven. 1 John 1, 8 to 9. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. Can't deceive God after all. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. See how being faithful and just includes forgiveness. This is really, really good news. And God is really gracious and he's really good and generous and really loving. But you see, the forgiveness is not just offered to me, it's offered to you and your friends, and your family, and your enemies. In fact, it's offered to the whole of the community of humanity. God's intention is that forgiveness should be available to every one. So if you're someone who signs up to Jesus, who's asked to be a friend of Jesus, who's called on the name of Jesus, and expected the forgiveness of Jesus, even if you've just accepted that it's a possibility offered, then you're part of a community, a community of the forgiven. You see, our prayer of confession now, prayer of repentance is about restoring a relationship with God, turning back to him. The thing is that God wants his people, his children, his household, his family to be a community of the forgiven. So a theologian and writer called Richard France who said this, talking about the church, he said all of its relationships will be marked by a forgiveness which is not a mere form of words but is an essential characteristic. Imagine that, forgiveness not being a thing you do but a thing you are as a community. 
If we're going to be a genuine community of the forgiven and not just a bunch of people who enjoy forgiveness by ourselves, then this desire and confession has to go deeper. Not just a desire to be in relationship with God, but a desire to be in relationship with one another. Belonging to God, sharing an inheritance with Christ. These things aren't about a vertical relationship, me to God, by itself. They're also about a horizontal relationship, us to each other. It makes sense then when Jesus continues in verses 14 and 15, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, don't misunderstand Jesus here or me. This isn't a trade-off. God does not withhold forgiveness until you've done your bit. But in a way, what Jesus is saying is even tougher than that because he's saying that our prayers of confession are about admitting our sin and about our desire to restore relationship. And so our confession is not self-regarding remorse. It's not how can I make me right? It's about how can I make us good together? Self-focused confession is worth very little, really. Indeed, we might just as well call that have mercy on me, a sinner, in a deep, dark cave. We won't be any better place to see where we're going afterwards. And all we'll be able to hear is our opinion of ourselves repeated over and over again in echoes. Now, true confession and true repentance is about relationships. It's not about your record of rights and wrongs because there isn't one kept. If our confession... If our prayers of confession are truly built on relationship with God, then we're asking God to do something, to forgive us and give us a fresh start. And we're asking him to renew the relationship, our relationship with him and our relationship with his community. Now you can see why Jesus says the words in verse 15. If you're not committed to the relationship with God's people, then you're not committed to the relationship with God. You can't choose to love God and say, I'll love you, but I'll leave your people out because they're sometimes annoying or because I don't want to forgive them. If you're not committing to a relationship with God's people, then your confession isn't real confession. If you want to restore a relationship with God, you have to be looking to restore a relationship with his people. Jesus illustrates this point later on in Matthew 18, a parable about an unmerciful servant tells a story. Jesus does of a servant who owes big money to the king, but the servant can't pay. He asks, for patience from the king, for time to pay the debt. The alternative is to be sold into slavery to repay it. The king is merciful and cancels the debt completely. The servant goes out and finds a collie, another servant, who owes a hundred to the first, when the first owed thousands to the king. But despite a very similar plea for patience, the first servant insists on having him sent to prison until he can pay the debt. And the king finds out and has the first servant arrested and demands everything he's paid back that was owed. In telling the story, Jesus is not saying that forgiveness is about earning it or deserving it. It's about a heart that understands forgiveness and is willing to forgive again and again. It's about recognising that forgiveness is truly a practical thing. If we, any of us, cannot put forgiveness into practice, then we haven't truly understood how much each of us needs God to forgive us. And in this way of looking at things, there is no space for giving up. We cannot ever have forgiven too many times, not unless we think God should limit his forgiveness of us. It's maybe a painful reminder that being tender-hearted hurts. Being people who forgive demands a lot of us. It, it demands an enormous amount of Jesus. If you're not willing to make space for forgiving others, what are you expecting God to do for you exactly? When we choose not to forgive, we set ourselves up as the one with authority over those who we think should be sorry to us. We claim God's position as arbiter. We effectively claim to know better than God whether or not someone should be forgiven and we don't. Jesus responds to this outrageous idea with a carpentry analogy. Don't point out someone who's got a bit of sawdust in their eye when you've got a whole plank in yours. It's, um, it's exaggeration isn't it? It's a, it's a ludicrous comparison to make a point. Back to Milton James again. Best not to point out the tiny weed in your neighbour's garden if you have an old fridge, a stinking mattress and half a motorbike in yours. And the truth is that if we're honest with ourselves, our garden is always full of junk. When we come before God asking for forgiveness, we ought to come and say, Father, forgive us. And with an attitude that's so humble and so understanding of our own messy garden. That we would never look down on somebody else's weed patch. And it's why Paul writes this to the Ephesians. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And when he writes 
to the church of Colossae, we get this. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Paul and Jesus make it clear that our forgiveness of each other is part of how forgiveness works. We should be a forgiving community. The alternative is plain straight bad news. Indeed, when we don't forgive, the fresh hurt it relates to remains where it is in the heart. We've not released it. We've not given it to Jesus to deal with. And then eventually that fresh hurt becomes stale and then starts to go mouldy and mouldy hurt becomes bitterness and then cynicism and sadness and pain and our heart is corroded by it all because we didn't want to forgive because we thought we knew better. Ephesians 4 again. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander along with every form of malice. When we don't forgive we get stuck in what has happened. We look backwards at how we've been hurt instead of forwards to where God is leading us. When we don't forgive, we make room for things that damage our relationship with each other. We prevent ourselves from being a community of the forgiven. We end up with snipey comments and comebacks, with sharp answers and frustrated asides, with a refusal to engage with those who have upset us, with avoiding people who have wronged us. We talk unkindly in private or in public about others. Trust me, I know these things happen because I've done them and because I hear them. Now these things don't happen because someone behaved badly to me, even though that does happen. It happens because I have not forgiven them. I have decided that they should not get my forgiveness, even though I want God to forgive me. And where does that leave our prayers of confession? Well, I believe it puts us in a place of real deep dependence on God, faced not just with the darkness of pain and struggle, but with the darkness of our, our own unforgiving hearts, our own bitter feelings. We cannot be in the relationship with God without confession. We cannot be a community of forgiven without God. So it's time we brought our unforgiveness before him, no matter how painful that kind of honesty might be. I'm going to finish by reading a prayer of confession. Almighty God, to whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs>